Hi, it's Maya here with my July reads and receipts. In these videos, I go through what I read, my TB account and how I'm doing with my challenges. I also haul some books on occasion, like in this video, and if you are interested in only specific books, there are timestamps in the description. In July, I took part in two readathons, uh, the Pop Culture Readathon and the Reading Rush. And honestly, after the Read Outside Challenge during a pandemic and the group book live show where the host hadn't read the book, I'm not really feeling the Reading Rush anymore. But meanwhile, the Pop Culture Readathon was a fun new readathon that I took part in. My TP account at the start of the month was 67 books, and I read a ton in July, so let's start with the reads. First, I finished two reads that didn't count for either of the readathons. The first was The Dark Magazine, issue 59, which is edited by Silvia Moreno Garcia and Sean Wallace. This is a digital magazine that I'm subscribed to, and it is horror short stories, and this was not one of my favorite issues. I wasn't really feeling any of the stories, even though uh, there are four stories, and two of them were by authors I've read from before and really enjoyed, Octavia Cade and Gemma Files. Octavia Cade's story was Otto Hahn Speaks to the Dead. In that one, one of the chemists who invented chlorine gas is haunted by the dead wife of his work partner. In Thin Cold Hands by Gemma Files, a girl discovers a creepy fairy that stays with her for her entire life. And then there was some sketches of country life by Peter Gutierrez, and it was quite a quirky collection of these weird figures who all live in this one village. And I actually was the most interested in that when it started. I really um, enjoyed the character of Stickman, but in the end, the story didn't really go anywhere. Then there was The Longest Night by Emily B. Cataneo. In this, an Icelandic village does this ritual to keep a ghost at bay during winter, but Birta has always wondered what would happen if they didn't do the ritual. But I didn't really feel any of these stories, and I gave the issue two stars. Then I read The Wicker King by Kay Ankrum, which is an Overdrive ebook, and it's a young adult contemporary. This one is a dark story about a codependent relationship between two teenage boys, Jack and August, and Jack has hallucinated nations, which the two treat like they are visions from this fantasy land that they pretended to play in as kids. And if you don't like mental health issues treated as maybe magic, then perhaps you shouldn't read this book. But I don't really know how I feel about this. It was a fast read, but I read it while I was out and about. Um, it was an overdrive and I just read it in small snippets from my phone, so I didn't concentrate in it that well. It was a fast read while I was doing that. It had like very short chapters. I understand that the physical book has like some sort of visual illustration thing going on as well, uh, with the book's pages becoming slowly darker. Like the ebook only had small illustrations about the, like the notes that the boys swap and things like that but not the pages becoming darker, um, obviously. I most often don't star rate the young adult contemporaries that I read because I'm not the target audience and often I have trouble getting uh, into the story. But sometimes I do read them out of curiosity. I had heard good things about this book, but I'm not going to give it a rating. I don't really even know what I think about it. It was a fast read, like I said. But now the 90s pop culture readathon started, and this was a really fun new readathon. Uh, it was hosted on Twitter during the whole of July. And I will link the Twitter account down below so whenever there's a new route you can maybe join. So there were different bingo boards that you could choose from and I chose Thrill Ride which had prompts inspired by like these horror and supernatural movies from the 90s. For the prompt Blair Witch Project black or white cover I chose Our Dreams at Dusk by Yuki Kamatani which I borrowed from Reya. It's a uh, contemporary manga. I know I just said that I have trouble getting into contemporary, but that is books. For some reason, I enjoy reading contemporary manga and comics. I had no idea what this book was about when I started reading this. I had only heard that it had LGBTQ plus characters. The specific rep in the first volume was gay and lesbian characters. And I was very surprised by how good this manga was. The first volume tells about this high school kid called Tasku, who is terrified that he has been outed as gay, and he's in a very dark place when he stumbles upon this house with a group of people who give him a community that he feels like he can belong to. I really like the storytelling. One of my favorite things in manga is when the mangaka is very adept at delivering emotional beats through the drawings. Kamatani just hits you with raw emotion from time to time, and the artwork is so beautiful, it has such delicate, clean lines, and I love this book and I gave it five stars. But content warnings for homophobia and suicidal ideation. Next I read a very different comic, and that one was Glory, the Complete Saga by Joe Keating and Sophie Campbell, and I read this uh, for the prompt Sydney Prescott book with a badass main character, and I read this one from the library. This is an over-the-top gory superhero, superpower saga, 
of Glory, who's this alien warrior who lives in, on Earth. It starts by following a human character who is looking for Glory. It seems that Glory's family is staging an attack on Earth to retrieve Glory, and humans just might be collateral damage. Glory was actually a comic character from the 90s, but I haven't read any of those older comics. I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought. Uh, sometimes I mind super violence, and sometimes I don't, and this time I didn't mind it. I loved all the alien family stuff, both flashback and present. At first I wasn't really that into the present storyline, but when Glory's sister Nanata was introduced, I got more into the present storyline as well. Nanata was my favorite, and the fight between the two when they first meet after a long while and their discussion afterwards was one of my favorite things. I found it so hilarious. So what I liked about this was this dysfunctional, super-powered alien family. The story could be a bit messy at times. Uh, some things weren't explained and then there were some things, some choices that I just didn't like. And I gave this one 3.5 stars. Next for the prompt, it's just a bunch of Hocus Pocus, a um, book that includes magic. I read City of Dragons by Robin Hobb, which is an old ebook. So I continued on my read through the Rainwald's Chronicles. This is the third book, so I have one more book left to go uh, until I can get back to Fitz and the Fool. And this series, the Rainwald's Chron Chronicles, has been my least favorites of Hobb's Realm of the Elderlings books so far. In this series we follow a group of sickly dragons and the human keepers who are on their way to find this mythical city where dragons used to live together with this race called the Elderlings. The pacing just seems off and I don't care about some of the storylines. I do like the dragons and all the Elderling city stuff and I liked Cedric and Alice especially in the first book but I feel like they haven't gotten a lot to do, especially Alice, after that first book. This book also has chapters from the point of view of Hest, who I can't stand, but I do love Hobbes' writing style and the world that we are exploring, and I did like this more than I liked the second book, which had a lot of drama between the teen keepers that I didn't care about. I gave this one three stars. Next from the library I read a non-fiction book called The Lady from the Black Lagoon by Mallory O'Meara, and this one was for the prompt I know what you did last summer, read a 2019 release. So this is a non-fiction book about Millicent Patrick, who is the woman who designed the creature from the Black Lagoon, and it's also the story of the author Mallory O'Meara going around and trying to find clues and information about Millicent's life. I found the topic super interesting and Millicent seemed like a colorful character, but I was left wanting more in the end. I wanted to see more of Millicent's sketches that O'Meara talked about in the book, and also I wanted more from the research. Omira isn't really a researcher, she is a Millicent Patrick fan. I am happy that her enthusiasm led her to find more about this fascinating monster creator woman. Even though Omira was unsure of where to look and how to research archives and things, I hope that other people will continue what Omira started and write more on this topic. I gave this book three stars. Now the reading rush started, so I had two readathons going on, and the first book that I finished during it was Certain Dark Things by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This is an old ebook that has vampires in it, and I've been meaning to read it for a while. For the reading rush, it was for the prompt to read a book that's set on a different continent from yours. So this one was set in Mexico, so North America. I actually started this before reading rush, but I was about 40% of the way through, so I counted it. And for the pop culture readathon, it fulfilled the prompt, The Mummy Book with the Undead. I've read two things from Silvia Moreno Garcia before. And this one is clearly my Moreno Garcia book. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise because I love vampires. But she writes standalones that are on such different topics that you just have to find your own. This tells about vampires in Mexico, mainly Atul, who is a descendant of these Aztec vampires. And there's also a human character, this uh, street kid called Domingo, who ends up helping Atul escape from this rival vampire clan. So there's vampire gangs, street kids and cops on the streets of Mexico City which is supposed to be a strict vampire-free zone. What I loved about this book were the many different vampire types. The Tlahui Pochli, which are the Aztec vampires, and the Necros, who come from Europe, were the main ones, but there is also one revenant who is this Nosferatu type of vampire, and he was my favorite. He is this hermit type who begrudgingly helps the main characters. I'm not big on gangster stories, but I just love vampire lore, and this was a fast-paced story with a lot of vampire goodness, and I gave it four stars. Next I read an older digital comic and that one was Food Baby by Lucy Bryan and this is for the Reading Rust prompt. Read a book with a cover that matches the color of your birthstone and this is the closest I could get and I didn't fulfill any pop culture readathon from prompts with this. These are little comics about food as well as actual recipes. I don't really have a lot to say about this. The art was cute. I'm not gonna give it a rating. 
Then I read An Inhabitant of Carcosa by Ambrose Pierce and I downloaded this classic short story from Project Gutenberg. This fulfilled the reading rush prompt of reading a book completely outside of your house. Yeah, that one, uh, it's only like four pages long. And the next challenge, the challenge for the pop culture readathon was light as a feather, stiff as a board, read a book with a creepy or haunted feel. So this is about a man who wakes from thought and realizes he is wandering on an unfamiliar and desolate expanse of plain. This is the horror short story that Chambers got the name Carcosa from for The King in Yellow. I can see how this influenced other horror writers. These are tropes that pop up a lot later on. Sometimes the prose was very evocative and sometimes the prose was a bit too much. I had a fun time reading this very short classic horror story for a bit of horror education and my rating reflects that I just find this sort of stuff super interesting. I gave it four stars. Next I read two volumes of owned manga. I read The Girl from the Other Side, volume 7 and volume 8 by Nagabe. And these were for the challenges for the reading rush to read a book starting with the and for pop culture readathon Practical Magic, a book that involves a curse. So these continue the story of the little girl and her cursed caretaker. And this is a beautiful dark fairy tale of a manga with black and white artwork and very mystical feel. Goth aesthetic meets a heartwarming father-daughter-like relationship between a girl and a monster. I gave this four stars. I bought volume eight, so it upped my TBR, but then reading it brought it back down, so it's still at 67. Then the next book only fulfilled a reading rush challenge, and that challenge was read a book in a genre you always want to read more of, and I chose Japanese contemporary literature. So from the library I read Professor Yatalo Denhoitoja or The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa. So this tells about a housekeeper who is sent to her new post, which is in the home of this elderly maths professor who has short-term memory loss. So I think uh, his memory can only hold things about 40 minutes. Slowly a friendship forms between these two and the housekeeper's son, mainly through communicating in mathematics. I did find the character sympathetic, but I know I would have enjoyed this more if it had focused on something that I'm more interested in, like linguistics, for example. Check this out if you like Japanese contemporary literature, mathematics and maybe baseball. But I gave it two stars. Then I read a graphic novel from the library and that one was I Kill Giants by Joe Kelly and J. M. Ken Nimura. And this is for the reading rush prompt to read a book that inspired a movie you already seen, a no pop culture read of prompt. This is a contemporary comic about a girl who lives in her own fantasy world to try to escape what is happening to her family in real life. It's not really my sort of thing. I have seen the movie and that was basically the only reason why I picked this up. I wanted something for this prompt and my library had had this on the shelf, so I went with it. I liked the movie more, but neither really left a lasting impression. Maybe two stars, it's not for me. Then I read something that was more for me, and that was Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh, which is a fantasy novella that I read from the library. This fulfilled the pop culture readathon challenge Candyman, a book with supernatural creatures, and the reading rush challenge to read the first book you touch. So I gave my boyfriend three very short books, and I had my eyes closed, he put them in front of me and I chose one with my eyes closed and it was this. This is a fancy novella set in our world and it tells about this green man who has his life changed when a new owner moves to Green Hollow Hall. So this is the first book in the Green Hollow duology and after reading this I instantly uh, reserved the second one from the library. I still haven't gotten it because they haven't gotten the copies they ordered yet. So Tobias lives in the forest, he is tethered to it and takes care of it. He lives in a little cottage with his cat and hangs out with the local dryads. Then Henry or arrives who is the new owner of Green Hollow Hall and Tobias's cottage um, is on the mansion's grounds. Henry is endlessly curious about the secrets and folk tales surrounding this forest and also very curious about Tobias. So this novella had a great atmosphere, it was very mythic, full of forest, magic and folklore and I love that sort of stuff and it progressed in a very slow and calm way even when it began to weave in the darker aspects of old secrets and tales. The budding interest and romance between Henry and Tobias was also very well done in my opinion, even though some people might want more than a short novella can give them. I liked all the characters, even though Tobias is not the type of character that normally gravitate towards. He's this big, strong, silent man archetype. And I really liked Henry, I think he was my favorite. 
and I was pleasantly surprised by the character of Henry's mother. So this had a lovely mythic and shadowy forest atmosphere throughout and I gave it four stars. Then I read The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval, which is an owned ebook and it is a horror novella and it's based on the horror at Red Hook by H.P. Lovecraft and it has the reputation of being the most racist story that Lovecraft wrote. I did read the Lovecraft story right before starting this to see how these two were in conversation. This fulfilled the pop culture rhythm challenge of Scream 2, a book in your second favorite genre, which for me is horror. This is set in 1920s New York and the main character is Charles Thomas Tester, who is a black man who is trying to make ends meet and keep a roof over his father's head by doing odd jobs. But he gets tangled in the magical world of Lovecraftian horror first by delivering this occult tome and then by in being invited or hired to play at this mysterious party by this old white recluse, Robert Suida. I have read The Changeling from Victor Laval before and I really enjoyed that, but I like this more and I really like the novella length. It really works for this story. This is a dark story which uses Lovecraft's canon to tackle topics like racism and police brutality, and it was very intense and I wanted to see what would happen to Thomas Tester. I gave this one four stars, it was a really good read. And I would also recommend, if you're interested in like Lovecraft story reimaginings, uh, The Dream Quest of Velit Bow by Keith Johnson, which takes a look at uh, Lovecraft's handling of women in his stories. So that was the end of the readathons. I completed two bingo rows for the pop culture readathon and I fulfilled all the reading rush reading challenges. In July, I also finished one more book that didn't count for either of the readathons, and that one was The Light Tree by Frances Hardinge. And this is an own physical book. It's a historical young adult mystery. I thought it was fantasy, but it didn't really have any magical elements. Everything could be explained by science. And you picked this for me to read in a poll in May. And it took me this long to read it because sadly I didn't enjoy it. The focus of the plot and the setting just turned out not to be for me. It took me two months to finish. I was hoping for a somewhat spooky atmosphere with mythical or magical elements, and I don't think I got that. Faith is a young girl who loves science, but being a girl, she is not supposed to practice it. Faith and her family move to this island for her father to help at this archaeological dig, and Faith finds out about some secrets and discovers the tales of a lie tree in her father's journals, but this happens at about the halfway through the book. I found this to be very slow, and for the most part I didn't enjoy reading it. The main reason was how nasty and mean everything everyone was, the villagers towards the family and the family towards faith. I didn't have any tolerance for it. It was just tiring and painful to prod through. Everything was so incessantly dreary and unpleasant and I didn't like reading it. This is basically a murder mystery book that's very slow to get started. The book got a little bit more interesting around the 200 page mark, which is how long it took for the mystery and the sort of magical elements to really turn up, but I still didn't really care after that. In theory, the focus on science and how people underestimate women were good but I didn't need a whole book for that. Maybe the main character needed to learn that other women were also complete, interesting, three-dimensional people, but I knew that already. So the ending was okay, I liked it, but I didn't enjoy reading the 400 pages before that. I am not giving up on Frances Hardinge, even though this is the first book that I've read from her. I think the setting and the topic, like I said, wasn't for me. I am looking forward to reading something from Hardinge that fits my interests better, something that has more fantastical elements. I know a lot of my friends love this, so I'm sorry to say that I didn't enjoy it. I gave it two stars, maybe 1.5, but at least reading this brings my TBR count to 66 books. From the books that I showed on my pop culture readathon on TBR video, I didn't get to two books. I didn't get to The True Queen by Zen Cho. I did read this in August, actually. I switched the curse prompt to be the girl from the other side, and I didn't read Unraveling by Karen Lord. I switched Silver in the Wood for the Supernatural Creatures prompt. And there were also a few second options that I didn't get to, but now let's go to the receipts. I uh, once again didn't make progress in my challenges, so I didn't make progress in the 10 books I want to read in 2020, in the reread challenge or in the TBR chart challenge. So tell me if these videos are boring because I clearly I'm not fulfilling or completing or making any progress in my challenges this year. Let me know. So let's move straight on to a haul, but first a little unhaul. I decided to get rid of Wildfell by Michael Rowe. I read about how Rowe had repeatedly used the n-word in a conversation with author Jessia Burke, who is a black woman. So this one's going and my TBR is now 65. I ordered three physical books in June, which arrived in July, uh, but they don't up my TBR count. The first one is Shigenori Soetima and B Studio Art Unit Artworks 2. So I have Shigenori Soetima's first art book and this one also has art from other people 
in the studio working on the Persona games mainly. And this one is an art book and I have looked through it so it doesn't up my TBR account. I also ordered a physical copy of The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. I have already read this twice so it doesn't up my TBR. It's my favorite Jemisin. This is the wrong cover because I really want the one that has a yellow spine. But apparently that's the US edition and they have changed the covers and I wanted to have this old cover illustration so I ordered this one. And then like you saw I bought the Girl from the Other Side, Volume 8, and I read it this month, so it doesn't up my TBR account. Now for the books that actually bring my TBR account up, I got The Angel of the Crows by Catherine Addison from Rhea, who had ordered one and for some reason got two. So now my TBR is 66 books. I thought I was done with book buying then, but then I realized that my stamp card to a bookstore was expiring in July. It's valid for one year and every time you buy a paperback you get a stamp and then you get a free paperback at some point. I was missing one stamp for a free paperback, so I went and bought two books. I bought In the Labyrinth of Drakes and Within the Sanctuary of Wings by Mary Brennan. These are books four and five, so the last two books in the Memoir by Lady Trent series. I bought this and then I got this one for free. So my TBR goes up to 67 and 68. But now I own the whole series. I also bought the ebook of Artificial Condition by Martha Wells because it is my favorite Murderbot novella and it was on sale. I have of course read this and anyway ebooks don't up my TBR account. I just wanted to own it because it's my favorite. I also pre-ordered some autumn releases but none of them of course arrived in July so we will talk about them in the months that they arrived. And now finally for the stats, which are the highest of the year so far. In July I read 16 books, which was 3600 pages. On average I read 116 pages a day, that's a lot for me, and took on average 14 days to read a book. There were once again a couple of books that I had been reading for a long time, like The Lightry, which skewed that average a bit. And my current physical TBR number is 68 books, so even though we went up one book, at least it's still under 70. But this was a very long video, that's all from me for now. Talk more to me in the comments and I'll see you in my next one.